Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly COVID-19 update for the town of Plymouth. I'm Steve Trifletti. This is update number 91. I'm your Plymouth Town Moderator. We're here each Wednesday at noon for this update. And this forum is being brought to you live by PAC-TV on Comcast. You can watch on channel 15 on Verizon channel 47. You can also watch this on PAC-TV streaming channel by going to pactv.org slash live. For questions during today's forum, please email our panelists at PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org, and these forums can be replayed at PACTV.org slash Plymouth. Today's participants include uh, Kenneth Tavares. He is chair of the Select Board for the Town of Plymouth. Also, Plymouth State Representative Matthew Muratori. Mark Wilson, he is an epidemiologist from Plymouth. Also, we're joined by Scott Williams. He is principal for West Elementary School in Plymouth. And Stephen Cole, he is the executive director for Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. Now, we're going to show a photo of our first presentation last year. It was on Saturday, March 11th. And uh, things were a little bit different. You'll see a group of us, uh, including some who are still with us today, uh, seated together at a table in the studio uh, without masks. So, Ken, I'm going to throw it to you and... Uh, a lot has changed in the past year since we began this. Oh, you're certainly uh, right, Steve. And uh, it is interesting to see what's happened in the last year. As you said, uh, we didn't have masks when we had our first meeting. And today I'm sitting in my own house with the mask right next to me because I'm expecting a delivery at the front door. So uh, life uh, has certainly changed uh, for all of us. And then that's what uh, I wanted to center my comments on today is that uh, um, we've, we've passed the one year anniversary, but we still have the same concern of daily watching the numbers uh, uh, go up, uh, especially in Plymouth in the last week or so. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, we need to keep emphasizing masks and maintaining that distance. Uh, each of us, I think, even though it's still a year later, have to be responsible for our conduct and that of uh, the younger people of, of the community. We've got to set an example. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're all bracing for a rise in the next few weeks, and we need to get through this. We're making progress. Uh, I am so pleased that I was able to get my second shot but that doesn't mean that um, everything's foolproof, that uh, we can just go ahead and do what we want to do. We need to be careful. We need to be observant. Uh, on a more uh, pleasant note, uh, last night the Board of Selectmen once again uh, gave a number of licenses for outdoor dining. So we're certainly looking forward to things uh, that are coming up in the next month or two where we didn't have that kind of hope a year ago. Together we can do this. Alone, we, we will fail. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, and that's Kenneth Tavares. He is chair of the Select Board for the Town of Plymouth. You can send your questions to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. And yes, people continue uh, to get their shots. Our floor director, Donna Rodriguez, is not with us. Uh, she's getting her shot now, however, uh, we're supported by uh, Melissa Matinzi, uh, who is here, a member of the PAC TV staff, and she's also a town meeting member, which reminds us that town meeting is a week from Saturday on April 3rd at 8 a.m. And tonight there'll be a town meeting preview uh, carried live on PAC TV. Uh, it begins at 6 o'clock. A uh, town meeting is participating uh, remotely, the members. Uh, both tonight and at town meeting. And at this time, we're going to begin our medical segment. We welcome back uh, Dr. Mark Wilson. Uh, he is an epidemiologist uh, from the town of Plymouth. And Mark, you have been also speaking uh, throughout the community. Most recently, uh, you spoke to the Plymouth Rotary Club on Monday uh, and shared some of uh, the questions that you receive uh, in your capacity uh, as an epidemiologist. So welcome back. Thanks very much, Steve. Yeah, that was a, a real pleasure. And, and I'm hopeful that uh, the kinds of information we're providing uh, to the community are, are useful, informative, and will help them to better understand um, the problems. 
What I'd like to do today is really provide some information about a COVID transmission issue that some scientists are now beginning to take very seriously and also address a couple of questions that are associated with becoming vaccinated. This first topic is a concern that the COVID coronavirus can be transmitted from humans back to animals. So most everyone knows that the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus originally came from bats and then spilled over to another animal species before eventually spilling over again to infect humans. Because of this very efficient person to person transmission that we now know about, uh, we have a human pandemic and um, some amount of infection is probably gonna continue indefinitely into the future, at least globally. So ever since this coronavirus spillover occurred, scientists have been considering the opposite problem that some are calling virus spillback, uh, that is from humans back to other animal species. This spillback is uh, possible where suitable animal reservoirs have been infected and they would provide the virus with new hosts in which to survive and mutate and maybe jump yet again. So spillback was actually seen last fall in the Netherlands when hundreds of thousands of mink uh, on a large fur farm became infected from one person and all of them had to be slaughtered to prevent further spread. And this same spillback actually occurred in mink farms of other European countries. Uh, in a really extreme response, Denmark eventually had to kill all of the country's 17 million mink in order to prevent further spread of the coronavirus in animals. Some mink farmers were actually uh, subsequently in turn infected with a spillback virus strain, showing that the virus can be passed back to humans and probably to other unrelated wild animals. New strains then can evolve and some may be more contagious and possibly even more pathogenic. In order to anticipate and prevent this kind of spillback and further spread, better animal surveillance and quarantine systems for SARS-CoV-2 virus are being designed and implemented. And also research is underway to understand the conditions that encourage transmission uh, from humans to animals. So the threat of animal to human to animal transmission of microbes in, in general and for the COVID virus in particular remains very real. But in the meantime, we can count on increasingly widespread vaccination to help curb the, the current COVID pandemic. Now, now for a question, uh, and it's the following. For women who are pregnant and receive a COVID vaccination, will the resulting antibodies be transmitted to their child? Very simply, the good news is yes, newborns do receive antibodies from their vaccinated mothers. And this is actually what was hoped for uh, since it's been known that pregnant women who had COVID infection and developed natural immunity were able to pass on that immunity to their babies. Recent studies have now shown that mothers who were vaccinated with either the Moderna or uh, Pfizer mRNA vaccine transferred their antibodies to their fetus through the umbilical cord blood before birth. And in addition, these studies have demonstrated that newborns continue to receive antibodies through their mother's breast milk. And these findings come from a small study in Israel and then a larger, more recent study, uh, actually here in Massachusetts of 130 pregnant women and, and lactating women. Uh, and th these uh, recent reports have really shown in addition then that uh, one uh, particular study uh, of, of a pregnant woman who had received only her first dose of the mRNA vaccine, but had antibodies in her umbilical cord upon giving birth. And so uh, it's, it's very strong evidence now that transfer of antibodies is occurring and uh, will protect then the baby. Uh, this is contrary to the initial worries that many people had about the possible vaccination harm to a pregnant woman or the fetus. Um, and so it's just proven to be the opposite. Vaccinating pregnant women is not only safe, but provides protection to both the mother and the baby. And although we now know that babies can receive COVID-19 antibodies from their mothers, it's still going to take some time uh, to determine how well those antibodies actually protect the babies and, and for how long. So more time and further research uh, will tell, but this is already excellent news for both mothers and babies. One more question that um, I'd like to address, and it's the following. Is it safe for me to donate blood shortly after getting vaccinated 
or might that interfere with my developing antibodies? Also, if a vaccinated person donates blood, does the vaccine get donated along with it? So the Red Cross has uh, guidelines for uh, blood donation and they uh, indicate that it is not necessary to wait to donate blood. You can go ahead and donate blood after being vaccinated. Um, and this is especially important because the pandemic's had such a huge impact on blood donations. That it's, it's really important that everyone who wants to donate blood really do so. Um, unless you're showing COVID signs at the time uh, of, of going to give blood, you should not hesitate uh, at all. Uh, and include, including just after you've been vaccinated. Red Cross can also use your whole blood and platelets, but they won't be used in your plasma if you've been given the vaccine. Also, remember that donating blood will not weaken or reduce how well you are protected against COVID. Those of us who have either been infected or vaccinated produce antibodies and what are called protective T cells that are specifically aimed at the COVID virus. And these immune responses, they're mostly stored in different parts of the body and they're quickly produced and put into circulation uh, only if you're re-exposed to the coronavirus. And in addition, really, there's only a small amount, one pint of blood that's taken during each donation. So very few antibodies are removed from you. For these reasons, uh, the benefits of you being vaccinated will not be transferred through whole blood donation to someone else. So regardless of your vaccination status, everyone should be reassured of the safety and need for blood do donation um, at any time that you can. So please, uh, don't hesitate and go ahead and, and give blood uh, whenever you're able. Let me stop there and I'd be happy to answer any questions that viewers might have later on in the program. Thanks. Thank you, and that's Dr. Mark Wilson. He is active professor emeritus, University of Michigan School of Public Health, and he's here to answer your questions. We're now gonna turn to our education segment. We welcome, uh, for the first time, the principal of West Elementary School, Scott Williams. Welcome, Scott. Thank you, Steve, very much. Can you hear me fine? We can. All right, so thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come today and uh, present on behalf of Plymouth Public Schools. We are thrilled beyond belief to welcome our students back full-time on Monday, the 29th of March. Uh, we are very excited, and it's, it's quite a monumental time for the children of Plymouth. Um, before I move forward, I, I have to reflect a bit and look back to where we were a year ago. And the last time that uh, this this uh, uh, catastrophe like this has uh, been plopped in front of us was in the Spanish flu of 1918. And I don't think any of us were around for that catastrophe. Um, there were no there was no training manual. There was no there were no guidelines. There was no graduate course to take. So it really was a time of, of sink or swim, uh, survivorship, and, and do or die. And I've seen, and I, I'm sure I speak for my colleagues in Plymouth when I say that I've seen great heroes emerge from this very dark time. Um, teachers became technology directors, uh, parents became teachers, and students really became independent learners and thinkers. So. I really have to pause for a moment and applaud all of those stakeholders in, in getting through this very challenging time. Um, it's just amazing the goodness and the greatness that I've seen emerge during this time of adversity. Um, teachers doing their best to teach through computer screens. <laughs> that is particularly challenging at the elementary level. It's very difficult. So thank you to our parents for juggling it all. It was not easy to hold the job and be a teacher and be a parent all at the same time with no training. So a special thanks to our parents. And then the real heroes are our students. They have risen up during this time. They have become um, independent thinkers and learners, certainly during my lifetime and, and the first generation to ever be faced with such challenges with public education. So a shout out to all of those people for their for their hard work and their tireless efforts. Um, we're excited to open the doors on the 29th. We have been working very closely as an elementary group. So um, we've been working across the district, across the enterprise of Plymouth, 
safety is on the front burner. That is our strongest and most important lens that we look through when we consider reopening schools for all of our students. Um, it's been on the front burner for all of us. We've worked uh, very closely to follow the CDC recommended guidelines, as well as the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. All of those COVID protocols and safety measures that we have been operating since school opened in September for our hybrid model will not be abandoned and they will continue to be followed in good faith. Um, principals, and we've been collaborating very closely with our central office leadership team, our nurses, uh, the medical community at large, our, our teachers, our custodians. It really has been truly a team approach um, and it's taken everyone to really put their best, best foot forward in this endeavor. So in terms of the operation of our schools, the CDC recommendations are going to be followed. Students will now be three feet apart in classroom per the CDC guidance. Um, the exception to that is during eating time, which would obviously involve snack or lunchtime. Students will be six feet apart um, following those recommendations. Masks are now mandatory for all students K to five. So that, uh, that is a very strict, uh, uh, we're in accordance with the CDC guidance on that. And again, I just wanna reemphasize and reiterate that COVID protocols that we've been practicing now since September will continue to be followed. That includes socially distanced, hand washing protocols, sanitizing, um, our traffic patterns in our, in our corridors and hallways will remain one way very similar to what you might see on the floor at a grocery store. So none of those protocols will change during this time. Um, we also are going to uh, recommend and embrace any sort of outdoor instruction. So um, teachers are encouraged to be outdoors as often as they can. Our physical education classes during uh, cooperative weather, we, we know in New England that can be a challenge, but um, all of those instructional opportunities, uh, eating and snack, as often and as much as possible, we encourage folks to, to practice those outside. Um, special shout out to our nurses. Our school nurses have been incredible partners and great liaisons to our, our principals and teachers as we operate our schools. They're in close contact with the medical community, giving us great guidance and really uh, logical, prudent steps being taken to make sure that we're operating on, on a safe level. So I have to give a special shout out to our nurses. Thank you to them. And then um, also very happy to report that Plymouth Public Schools, uh, each student now has their own Chromebook device. So thank you to Julia Colby, our technology director. Thank you to Alan McLean. Our technology friends have really stepped up and all of our students now have their own Chromebook K to five. This is not only uh, optimal for student learning in the classroom, um, because we do live in a day and age of technology, but it also helps follow COVID safety protocols because we're not sharing devices. So thank you to them. Our playground structures, uh, we have uh, reopened those structures follows, following CDC guidance. So we will be sanitizing and hand washing before and after lunch and recess, as well as spraying down those structures uh, before the recess cycles to make sure it's an additional layer of safety for our children. Um, I know at West School, our PTA has funded uh, tens of thousands of dollars for new playgrounds that we're finally able to use. So that is very exciting. Um, we do ask one favor of our parents. <laughs> we know that we've asked a great deal of you this year, but when we open school on the 29th, we do anticipate that there'll be longer times dropping off in the morning. There'll be parent uh, drop-offs in the morning that will increase in volume. There will also be longer dismissal times in the afternoon. Please bear with us, please be patient. This is due to COVID safety protocols. We are trying to avoid large volumes and large numbers of students congregating in one location. So we've had to stagger our exit times at the end of the day. Um, we do anticipate longer times dropping off in the morning and longer times picking up at the end of the day. We appreciate your cooperation and your patience. We're very hopeful that it will, as time moves on and as we, as we practice those new operational protocols, it will get quicker and it will be better. Um, and, and again, just, just thank you for the opportunity. We're very, very excited to have our students back. That's great news. And that's from Scott Williams. He is principal 
of West Elementary School. He'll be with us for the remainder of our presentation to answer any questions you might have. We're now going to move on to our business segment. We welcome back uh, Steve Cole. He is the Executive Director of Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. Steve, welcome back. Hi, Steve. Glad to be back. Thanks for having me. Uh, I typically like to talk about, uh, well, I talk about unemployment issues, not necessarily like to talk about them, but before I do, uh, it always gives me some pleasure to be able to, to sing the accolades and praise of some, uh, some of my board members. Matt, as you know, is a member of my board, and earlier this week, uh, the legislature passed a stabilization bill for unemployment insurance in the Commonwealth that not only reduces tax burden for individuals and businesses, but creates a predictable path forward for how these uh, increases in unemployment insurance will affect them over the next couple of years. Uh, it also reduced the burden for those folks who receive PPP money, and that money has been forgiven. So uh, I don't want to steal his thunder in case he wants to talk about it, but I do want to uh, recognize Matt for his efforts and his colleagues, uh, because that fund, frankly, has been the lifeblood of the Commonwealth and the stabilization efforts that he and his colleagues have put in, I think gives us much to look forward to as we rebound and recover. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit, frankly, was um, uh, last time I was here, I mentioned the lost jobs. Uh, we had 178,000 fewer jobs in the Commonwealth this past December compared to December 2019. Those numbers have since been revised, and I saw numbers coming out of the governor's office to the tune of 250,000 jobs in the Commonwealth that are lost. They're not coming back in all likelihood. Now, something coming out of Forbes I want to share as a, as a silver lining is that half of, uh, half of the major uh, employers in the country are reporting they're very optimistic about seeing pre-pandemic levels uh, when it comes to hiring. But that means that the other half do not feel that way. So one of the things I really want to uh, stress on today, you've heard me talk a lot about entrepreneurship in the past. I'm really going to double down on this because there's two ways, frankly, we're going to get back to where we were. One, we invite myriad, several major employers to relocate. 500, 600 jobs at a time. Still doesn't get us to 250,000 as quick as we need to. Or we could focus on entrepreneurship, take that homegrown approach, and really stress that folks who have that skill set and we have those resources here to help you, uh, you can start your own business. Create the type of job you want to have, that you want your friends and your family to have. We're also watching, too, how the workforce is changing as a result of this. Uh, recently, we talked about how Governor Baker announced that the executive staff, he foresees long-term mixed mixed week uh, uh, work uh, work schedules, meaning people will spend two or three days at home and come into the office two or three days. I was reading this morning, in fact, that Citigroup announced something similar. They have 210,000 employees, and they're announcing that on top of the two-day weekend, they're going to allow employees to work from home two additional days. They're also putting in, in, in interesting uh, restrictions in how they hold meetings. Uh, no Zooms on Friday. And there's myriad other things that they're implementing to help uh, workers uh, reacclimate to the new normal. Uh, that said, uh, I looked into other companies who were doing similar things. Siemens, uh, Spotify, Twitter, Target, Facebook, Dropbox, uh, American Express, Capital One. This is the new trend. This is clearly seemingly the new trend, this mixed work week. What does that tell me? Well, as I'm diving into these numbers, that tells me a couple of things. And I couldn't help but get away from or draw, draw myself to the conversation about the two-day work week. When we ended up with a five-day work week, what happened to quality of life when we had a weekend or when we had fixed work hours? I think that what we're going to see, frankly, is some increased productivity in those places where these types of jobs can be supported. But frankly, what it does for me, it, it helps us mitigate traffic issues, right? How bad was traffic before all of this? I don't want to belabor the point, but these shifts are things that are going to have lasting effects, and it's going to affect us, because naturally, Boston being one of the 100 top metro areas in the country, and we are part of that MSA, the surveys include us in those hiring, uh, those hiring stats. Um, I'll pause there, Steve, but I do want folks to take away from this that the flexibility of this new revised work week not only provides an enhanced quality of life, giving people flexibility in how they get things done, but also possibly gives people an opportunity to work on their new ideas for their business. If you have a skill and you were previously unable to work on it because your work schedule and your commute was onerous, hopefully now I, I expect that people will, will, will take advantage of these revised schedules. And I want folks to know if you're listening to this, we're here to help you. If you don't know where to start or how to start, we'll be very glad to assist you. But entrepreneurship or recruitment is the only thing that's gonna get us out of these lost jobs. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, and that's Stephen Cole. He is Executive Director of Plymouth Regional 
Economic Development Foundation. He's here uh, to answer your questions coming in uh, to Plymouth Info at PAC TV. And as we move now to Plymouth State Representative Matthew Muratori. Uh, Matt, uh, thank you last week for hosting uh, while I was uh, actually out of town. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the state, the governor, for changing the guidelines on the travel advisory since uh, I was actually traveling. And one of the reasons we do this is because we want to keep people up to date. The travel advisory uh, changed. People don't have to quarantine if they've either been fully vaxxed, which I have been, or if they had a test, a negative COVID test within 72 hours prior to return, which I also had. So uh, thank you for that. And Matt, you saw early in the show, uh, just before Ken spoke, that uh, you and I and Ken were together in the studio without masks at the same table. We thought we were distancing. We thought we were being safe. But uh, much has changed in the past year, hasn't it? Yeah, that, that, that picture was kind of scary to see. I know Julie had sent that off to me earlier in the week, and uh, I couldn't believe that was our first, I, I don't recall it being our first meeting, but I guess it was, and we really weren't that distant. And actually, I have more hair now than I did then, too, which is <laughs> kind of like that. So there's a lot of positives that come out of this pandemic as well, so that's one of them. But uh, yeah, Steve, it, it, with regard to the travel advice, it's an advisory now uh, for travelers to be right on with that. Also, what was announced, too, is... Uh, this week, um, we started uh, vaccinating people with a 60 plus now. Um, also, there are certain job sectors that are involved now with, um, with getting the vaccine. So if you're a grocery store worker, a uh, utility worker, if you're in the food and agricultural industry, sanitation, public works, public health workers, you are now eligible for the vaccine as well. Um, April 5th, we'll start um, individuals 55 and older. Um, and if you have one medical condition, that will start April 5th. And then the general public uh, will be able to sign up for vaccines uh, the week of April 19th to start that process. Uh, we feel comfortable as the Commonwealth that we will have plenty of vaccines by that point too, uh, to be able to get everyone done. At this point, uh, we have 1.1 million uh, residents of the Commonwealth that are fully vaccinated. Uh, that's out of 4.1 million people that we're looking to get vaccinated or that the goal that we're looking to get to. So, um, you know, we're about, you know, 25% there at this point. Um, we've been shipped over 3.4 million vaccines to date. Um, and we've administered uh, through a little over 3 million. We hit the 3 million mark of vaccinations yesterday, uh, which is 87.3% uh, administered vaccines to the folks in the Commonwealth which puts us, in, uh, puts us in the top 10 in the country with the, the administration of the, uh, of the vaccines. Um, with regard to um, testing, uh, we haven't talked about that too much. We're, we're still doing a lot, a lot of testing. We were doing over 100,000 per day. Now we're down to about 40, 50,000 per day uh, of testing. The positivity rate is at 2.2% at this point. Um, we have 608 people in the hospital at this point, so that number is, is down. Even though it's ticking up a bit, it's, it's still down to the height where we were about a year ago uh, at almost 4,000 people in the hospital and a positivity rate of 24%. So you can see we've made, we've made some great strides uh, since then. Uh, the, the death toll is, is still unfortunately creeping up. We're at 16,578 folks who have passed away in the last year. Um, the confirmed cases here in the Commonwealth uh, over the last year is 582,000. Um, and the active cases we currently have are 27,000 uh, 27, at this point. Um, in Plymouth, uh, in the town of Plymouth, uh, the cases that we've had for the last year, there's 4,231 cases. Right now we have 215 active cases here in Plymouth um, with 150 deaths uh, in the last year. Our positivity rate is still on the high end, which is why we are one of the one of 20 communities still in the red. Uh, we went back in the red last week, as you know. Uh, we're at 4.74 percent productivity uh, um, positivity rate. Um, as I and as, as I said, uh, in the Commonwealth, we're at 2.2 percent. So we've still got some work to go here in Plymouth. Uh, Plymouth County overall has had a total of 877,000 uh, cases of coronavirus in the last year. Um, and that's at a, and they're running at a 3.18 percent um, positivity rate here in Plymouth County. So the county is doing well as a whole. Plymouth is still struggling a little bit, um, but um, I, I think with everything we're doing, with continue to wear a mask and continue to um, social distance, we'll we'll be uh, fine moving forward. 
Um, with regard to, um, I, I'm glad Steve mentioned the, uh, the unemployment bill. We're actually going to enact that bill tomorrow, both on the Senate and the House side. Um, and then they will go ahead to head, to head to the governor's desk by tomorrow evening. So we expect the governor will be signing that in the next, in the next few days. So that will be enacted, which will be nice. Um, also wanted to just touch upon um, a graduation. I, I know, um, you know, Scott was talking about, um, you know, the schools and what they're going to be doing. There's some guidelines that came out about graduations too, for whether it's a college or a university or a school, um, that they, they've come out with some minimum safety standards um, that are saying that uh, you can have graduation in event spaces like a ballroom, private clubs, uh, public places, stadiums, arenas, ballparks. Um, you still would need to do the six feet separation, no food, no drinks. Um, um, you, could, you, could, you could have up to six people depending on the size of the facility you're in. At graduation, um, people need to attest that they've had no symptoms. Um, you know, and again, following the, 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 the guidelines of, you know, wearing a mask and, and, uh, and keeping the six feet apart will continue. So there's, there's some good news that's coming along the horizon. We're starting to see slowly we're getting back um, into where um, the new normal will be. Um, but we, do, we still need to kind of take it slowly. Um, we don't want to go too fast. The variants are out there, as, as was discussed. Um, the variants aren't as deadly that are out there, but they're still spreading. So we need to continue to increase vaccinations um, and de decrease the spread. With regard to the Kingston collection site we've talked in the past, Steve, um, we did verify, uh, Representative Lenatra and myself with uh, Senator Moran, uh, verify with Secretary Sutters last week that the Kingston collection is one of 14 regional collaborations that's still on her desk and is being reviewed. They have come down, they have, uh, they've seen the location, they've talked to the folks in charge, They've gathered all their information there. Uh, they should be making a decision shortly. Um, I, I'd say within the next three or four weeks, we should ha have a final decision on that. But again, it all depends on the amount of vaccinations that we're getting from the federal government, which we are getting more and more every week. So we're hopeful that uh, we'll have uh, another area, another regional collaboration open here in our area, uh, but more will be reported on that as it comes, Steve. So uh, that is the, uh, the update to me uh, from here, Steve, back to you. Uh, please send your in, uh, questions to Plymouth Info at PACTV.org. And next week, Matt, Ken, and I will be joined by uh, Dr. Philip Trifletti. He's an attending physician at Beth Israel Deaconess. Also, Dr. Barry Potvin, and he is the chair of the Board of Health for the Town of Plymouth. Our educational segment will be Joseph Murphy. He is the principal for South Middle School. And on the business segment, Amy Naples. She is the executive director of Plymouth Regional, uh, Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. We're now going to go back to uh, Principal Scott Williams for a question from a viewer. Uh, Scott, the viewer asks, what is the social or emotional support that will be available to students and families with the full return back to school? That's a, a very relevant, uh, very important question. So pl prior to COVID, prior to the pandemic, Plymouth Public Schools had already uh, put many resources together in place for our students. Um, social emotional learning and social emotional well-being has been very much the cornerstone of our of our planning. Um, we always think in academic terms of math, science, social studies, reading and writing, and academic rigor is very important in our schools, but we've also added to that base uh, a strong component for social emotional learning. The district had hired prior to COVID, um, Cheryl Delory, who is a, uh, she is, she is a on-site consultant for the district and she has presented at my particular school many times with our staff, giving them tools, tips and strategies on how to address social emotional learning in the classrooms. We fully understand and we fully appreciate that our students are coming back to us not the same way they left us a year ago. Um, we are prepared to meet those needs. We have psychologists on staff that are available. We've also partnered with Gosnell Counseling in, in the past. They have been involved with, our, with the needs of our students at our schools. Um, and then we've additionally, in my particular school, and I know this happens district-wide, we endorse strong uh, trauma training for our students who have had trauma, uh, traumatic events in their background. So 
please know that this is very important to all of us, all the educators in Plymouth, and we have put some safeguarded stops in place to address those needs when the kids come back. Thank you, Scott Williams, Principal, West Elementary School. We're gonna circle back now to our panel, uh, another opportunity for them to give us their uh, thoughts today. We're gonna to begin with Dr. Mark Wilson. Uh, Mark, uh, what else would you like us to remember today uh, with today's response to the coronavirus? Well, I'm, I'm a half, glass half full kind of guy, I guess. And, uh, and yet at the same time, there are really some dark clouds on the horizon. We've got increasing infection in some states, uh, new waves of COVID in many nations, uh, in some places inadequate vaccine, insufficient treatment uh, and so forth. Uh, new variants are possibly appearing. Uh, and I think we're all suffering from COVID personal protection and weariness. Um, but as I said, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. And I think there's good news here that despite the continued uncertainties and anxiety, vaccinations are going up quickly, at least in the United States and in particular in Massachusetts. Most people are really more careful than ever about distancing and masks. And the light at the end of the tunnel is really a bit brighter. We've got Plymouth students going back to in-person instruction. Um, our schools are practicing logical and prudent uh, COVID protocols and surveillance. Uh, we heard about opportunities uh, and creative planning to revitalize and recreate the local economy, more flexible ways of doing business. And so these are among the many positive signs that we should all recognize as moving in the right direction even while we continue interpersonal respect and protection. So I think the glass is actually becoming more than half full. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Mark Wilson, Professor Emeritus, uh, University of Michigan. And at this time, uh, we're gonna continue and go back to uh, Scott Williams at West Elementary. Uh, Scott, what would be a takeaway today uh, for our viewers? Uh, you've told us that students are coming back on Monday uh, full-time, uh, what should we be thinking about? I, I would like to just, again, convey sincerest thanks and gratitude for everyone's patience and also present uh, a, a high degree of excitement <laughs> because we entered education for our kids. We, we work in public schools to help children. We've devoted and trained ourselves, our backgrounds, our master's degrees, our graduate courses, and in some cases, doctorate work, it really is all about children. So we couldn't be happier that the kids are coming back on the 29th. It's been quite a year, um, but again, the parent community has been so strong and so helpful that the nurses, the custodians, the teachers, um, I never thought I would say this in my career, but we're starting, you know, we're starting a new school year in March. So that's that's quite an quite an abnormality, but uh, we are we are very very excited and grateful for our students to come back. We couldn't be happier. Thank you, and that's uh, Scott Williams. He is principal of West Elementary School. Uh, Stephen Cole, uh, with this unseasonably warm weather, uh, it feels as though our restaurants are able to expand uh, their offerings during COVID. I went out. Uh, for dinner Monday evening, and as I approached the restaurant, there were people sitting outside of the restaurant. I was then uh, escorted to the back to a tent with a heater uh, where we actually ate, and it felt as though uh, the restaurants in Plymouth are adapting uh, to the requirements uh, with social distancing. There was lots of signage when you first walked in. Uh, again, another night, I saw a sign at the restaurant saying, you've got 90 minutes in which to eat, uh, but uh, how is the business community responding uh, now as we move into the spring? Well, I guess that's what the VIP treatment looks like, huh, Steve? I'm not getting it myself, so I'm glad someone is. Uh, look, the, the business community here in Plymouth is resilient, uh, and I think that's been evidenced by how few closures we've had, uh, and I think that's been evidenced also by how quickly those places who did close down temporarily are rebounding. This is very encouraging for me for myriad reasons. When we started these programs, one of the earliest things I talked about that I'd like to do with the foundation is to create or help create that 18 hour downtown. You know, we have a lot of great restaurants, but there's only so much food capacity I have in myself. But if I can create dwell time 
and I have more time spent downtown, I'm going to get hungry again eventually. So as we kind of get back to this new normal, my hope, my expectation is that our business community is going to lead that way in creating that new normal for our downtown with that 18 hour goal. Thank you, Stephen Cole. He is the executive director of Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. Uh, Matt Muratori, as we approach town meeting uh, next week, last year you co-sponsored legislation allowing uh, Plymouth Town Meeting uh, to meet remotely, remote participation with uh, both the Zoom uh, conferencing platform and also the Be Voter. Um, you're still in the legislature. You're still busy trying to respond uh, to the pandemic. What other types of things might we see coming down the road from uh, the Massachusetts legislature? Well, I think one thing, Steve, we're looking at is, um, I know we extended uh, uh, this mail-in balloting and, and you know, doing remote you know, participation in town meetings till the end of June. But I think you're probably gonna see, there's gonna be some more discussion um, and more debate about whether to extend these on more of a permanent basis. I also think you know, when you were just talking about um, outdoor dining, you know, we're looking at to making this uh, more of a realistic, uh, rea I mean, making it more reality where restaurants will be able to do outdoor dining without having to get, you know, special permits through the town, et cetera. Uh, it just automatically happened between say April 1st and October 31st, anywhere in the Commonwealth that wants to do that. So, so there are other things that we're, that we're looking at, but those are some of the big things that we will be looking at. Um, I got to, I have to agree with uh, Dr. Wilson. I, I think uh, we are looking more optimistic. There are, you know, people do get concerned that the, you know, the infection rate is ticking up from 1.72 from, you know, two weeks ago to now 2.2. Uh, but again, the, let's, let's be realistic about it. It was at 24% back in last, last spring. Um, so, uh, but, but what the, the governor and his team is, uh, his uh, medical team, uh, look at these, look at this data daily. They've always made decisions based on the data, not dates. And if for some reason it, it starts getting out of control, then there's plans to go back down, you know, to, to, uh, step uh, phase three, uh, step two, or wherever we need to be. So rest assured that those numbers are being looked at every every single day and decisions need to be made to change. Uh, this governor is not, uh, not afraid to, to do that. So I think uh, with 14% of the population fully vaccinated now in the Commonwealth, I think that's that's room for optimism with, you know, getting more and more vaccines coming to us uh, probably as early as next week. We've been getting about 150,000. We expect to get a heck of a lot more than that at this point. Um, and, and where you know we, we should be up at some point giving you know two three hundred thousand vaccinations uh, you know per week, uh, if not more than that, uh, very shortly. So uh, we'll be able to get everyone else vaccinated. And so as, we, as more people get vaccinated, um, you know that that's going to uh, that's really going to kill the, the vaccine. Um, so we're, we're getting there. So half full. I agree with you, Dr. Wilson. We'll see you next week, Steve. Thank you, Matt Muratori, Plymouth State Representative. Thank you to all the members of our panel, Dr. Mark Wilson, uh, Scott Williams, Principal uh, West Elementary, Stephen Cole, the Executive Director, Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation will be here next Wednesday at noon. And now we return back to Ken Tavares, uh, Chair of the Select Board for the Town of Plymouth. Ken, what do you have for us? Thank you, Steve. Uh, I think this has been a very upbeat uh, meeting today. And my takeaway is that uh, opportunities await us. Uh, I don't think it matters what age you are, young, middle age, uh, seniors, there's a lot of good things that can, uh, can happen if we, uh, you know, work at it and want to make them happen. I think there are new adventures. Uh, uh, it's a different world from 1918 uh, when they came out and probably had more doubts uh, than uh, we could even imagine. But uh, I think that through this, that change can be our friend and a lot of good things are going to happen. Um, our priorities have, have changed uh, and I am so proud of Plymouth's response to that. You know, during this entire year, the government has not uh, shut down. The stores have not shut down, uh, you know, completely. People uh, have uh, taken uh, uh, challenges and, and uh, done well by them. So thank you to, to this community, to everyone that's involved, especially on the uh, first responder level and uh, on the government level. 
Uh, you have been responsible for doing a lot of good things and we are going to prevail. Um, I'll give you one just quick example in closing. A friend of ours uh, today was going for a, a second uh, shot. Uh, there had been some difficulty because of uh, scheduling to do it. And uh, she said that she uh, actually was in tears getting it. So, uh, you know, we are thankful for the small things. We're making things count. And uh, together, as we have said so many times in the past, uh, we are going to defeat this virus. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ken Tavares. He is Chair Select Board uh, for the Town of Plymouth. And again, thank you uh, to all our uh, participants and viewers. Uh, special thanks to PAC TV uh, for the support all the time as we prepare and present uh, these forums each week. Again, a reminder that we'll be back this evening at 6 o'clock for a town meeting preview coming to you live uh, from PAC TV. Town meeting members will be participating remotely uh, with the Zoom uh, video conferencing platform. Uh, I'm Steve Tripletti, uh, Plymouth Town Moderator. Uh, thank you and good day.